The Preface, Part 1 of The Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Preface. To the Right Reverend W. B. Ullathorne, D. D. O. S. B., Bishop of Birmingham. My Lord, it is with the greatest pleasure I dedicate this translation of St. Teresa's greatest work to your Lordship, and deeply grateful am I for having received your Lordship's kind permission to do so. I know well how devoted your Lordship is to St. Teresa, how much you admire her undaunted courage, fortitude, zeal, and confidence in God amidst all her immense labors and extraordinary interior trials and above all how anxious your lordship is that the same spirit of prayer and the same heavenly virtues with which that glorious virgin was so wonderfully endowed may be diffused more and more amongst all men and especially amongst those holy religious who have chosen the lord as the portion of their inheritance for ever the illustrious order of saint benedict has produced many admirable contemplatives and writers on mystical theology, all of whom speak in the highest terms of the works of St. Teresa. I am truly grateful for your Lordship's approbation of my humble endeavors to give a correct translation of those esteemed works, the doctrine of which the Church herself styles heavenly. I also return your Lordship many sincere thanks for your constant kindness towards me and the encouragement I have so frequently received from your Lordship to persevere in my humble labors may length of days be given to your lordship to rule with fruit a hundredfold over the diocese so dear to your lordship's heart and may saint teresa intercede for you that your lordship may have grace to imitate her heroic virtues begging your lordship's blessing i am my lord your very respectful servant john dalton aston deventry feast of saint aloysius 1852 Preface. I venture to present to the public another translation from the works of the glorious St. Teresa, one of her greatest and sublimest productions, the interior castle, or mansions. It may not, indeed, meet with the approbation of many whose judgment demands respect, whose experience on the mission is very great, and whose opinions are entitled to every consideration. Some may even condemn the translation of such a work as unintelligible to the generality of readers and uncalled for in our present state. They may blame me, too, and wish I had devoted my time to the translation of other more useful and interesting works. I am ready to bow to the decision of those who are my superiors in every respect, some of whom, I am aware, do not advocate the translation of any of the works written by St. Teresa. To state here all their objections, and to answer them at the same time, would perhaps be hardly respectful. And why? Because how far such translations may or may not be desirable is certainly a subject which requires much serious consideration, and everyone is entitled to his opinion on the matter. I acknowledge that the mere fact of a book having been written by a saint, however excellent it may be in itself, is not always a sufficient reason for translating it some spiritual works if translated into english might do much more harm than good still there seems to be a great difference of opinion as to the utility or propriety of translating certain lives of the saints or certain works written by them some for instance strongly condemn the life of saint rose of lima when it was first published by the oratians to whom we are indebted for so many valuable and edifying lives and yet how many more approved of that life the life of St. Teresa, too, has been considered by some as exceedingly mystical, unintelligible, dry, heavy, while many more, and I think the greater number of readers, have been delighted and edified by its perusal, and have spoken of it as worthy of general admiration, both on account of the supernatural wonders it relates, and for the practical lessons of perfection it inculcates. It would then be unbecoming in me to assume an air of authority and to decide in favor of this or that particular opinion. But as I have received the highest and most flattering encouragement, both from bishops and priests, to continue the translation of St. Teresa's works, 
I trust I shall not be blamed for presenting the public with the present translation. Many, I think, will admire it as a most sublime composition, and others may perhaps condemn it. For my part, I admire it exceedingly. I should indeed be sorry to condemn anything written by St. Teresa. But to praise this work, the interior castle, as it deserves, I am unable and to understand the saint's explanation of visions and raptures is given only to those who have experienced them but are we authorized to condemn a book simply because we cannot comprehend all that the saint says let us hear herself speak on this point as the contemplation of heavenly things and that glory which the blessed enjoy does not injure us but we rather rejoice thereat and endeavor to attain what they possess so neither will it hurt us to see that in this exile it is possible for so great a God to communicate himself to a few miserable worms, and for so excellent a goodness and so immense a mercy to love them. I consider it certain that whoever shall receive any harm by believing it possible for God in this land of exile to bestow such favors, stands in great need of humility and the love of his neighbor. Some may say these things seem impossible, and it is good not to scandalize the weak but the harm is less for those not to believe them than to neglect doing a benefit to those on whom god bestows those favors and who will excite themselves the more to love him who shows them such mercy our lord exceedingly loves not to have his works limited de anley remarks in answer to the objection that this work is unintelligible set pose a jusqu'ici empoche presque tot le monde de le lire on s'imagine que ces noms sont spéculations s'il est la vie que l'on ne peut rien comprendre cependant je suis persuadé que quel sublime qu'elle soit on ne laissera pas de les interdire et elles trouvent mêlées de tons d'instructions excellentes pour ce qui regarde les pratiques de vertu, qu'elles ne sont entre que très utile. Whoever carefully peruses the work will, I am sure, be convinced of the truth of this remark. How many excellent practical exhortations the book contains, and these too, are recommended and enforced by a vigor, majesty, and purity of language, which is truly astonishing. It is far superior in many respects to her life. S. Antonio considers it the best of all the other admirable works of the saint. F. Columbet says that though the interior castle is one of the last monuments of the piety of this great woman, and though it was written in the midst of troubles and afflictions of all kinds, yet it will always bear the impress of her wonderful genius. One is astonished at the vigor and grandeur with which several of the chapters are written. Ribera says of it, the reader will find in this book admirable learning, and will plainly see with what great excellence and majesty of style and force of examples she conducts a soul to the very gates into which she herself enters, raising her from one degree to another to her very center, which is the seventh mansion, the palace of the celestial spouse and the king of glory, Jesus Christ. The venerable Father Avila, in a letter addressed to the Holy Mother, praises and approves in the highest terms the doctrine concerning prayer and her account of visions interior speeches raptures etc which are mentioned in this and other works of the saint yepes palafox our own alban butler and the learned writers of the last magnificent volume of the bolandists father gratian saint peter of alcantara saint john of the cross saint louis bertrand saint francis borgia F. Balazar Alvarez, Father Ripalda, F. Vicenzo Baron, and Dr. Hernandez, both consultors of the Inquisition. All these and several other learned and celebrated men have exceedingly extolled the interior castle as a production that one might almost style inspired. To enable the reader to understand the book, I would recommend a diligent perusal of Cardinal Bona's Via Comprendi Ad Deum, and also his celebrated treatises de discretione spirituum father baker also in his sancta sophia has some excellent and valuable remarks on visions and raptures 
No one, it seems to me, should attempt to say anything on mystical theology unless he understand the subject thoroughly. But who can be a greater authority in this most difficult science than St. Teresa? She is preeminently its evangelist and doctor. God gave her a particular faculty, among her other sublime gifts, for translating her vast internal experience of the mystical life into intelligible language, and also of conveying what others might have felt or known, but had never been able to express, by means of ideas and illustrations at once apposite and familiar. The most remarkable feature in the writings of St. Teresa is that vigorous practical good sense which pervades whatever she says and whatever she advises. How practical, for instance, is the fourth chapter of the Seventh Mansion? And, indeed, in almost every chapter of the same work, the saint takes an opportunity of inculcating humility, a knowledge of ourselves, obedience, meekness, charity, zeal for souls, a horror for sin, and an ardent love of God. There is nothing vague or uncertain about what she says. Her language is of the most real, decided, and definitive character that there is in this great work things far beyond the depth of almost all readers is most true. But are there not most difficult things, hard to be understood, in the Holy Scriptures also? Alas, for him who reads nothing but what he understands, how many things are there which one may understand and practice in the interior castle, and how perfect will they become who practice what they do understand, and who nourish their faith with what they do not understand? The saint commenced this book at Toledo on Trinity Sunday in the year 1577. She finished it the same year at Avila. It was composed in obedience to her confessor, the Reverend Dr. Velasquez, who was afterwards Bishop of Osma. F. Gratian also united his command with that of Dr. Velasquez. The year 1577 was the very period in which the saint was engaged with the reformation of her order. And those who know her wonderful history will remember all the labors, sufferings, and persecutions she had then to endure. In addition to these, she was oppressed with bodily pains and infirmities, of which we can now have no idea. In her preface, she mentions having had, for three months, such a noise and weakness in her head that she wrote with pain and difficulty even on urgent business. And yet, in the midst of all her troubles and infirmities, she was able to compose, with the greatest calmness and ease, the present sublime work. How well did Teresa know and understand the power of holy obedience? End of the Preface, Part 1 The Preface, Part 2 of The Interior Castle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila, translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Preface, Part 2. For the convenience of the reader, I will endeavor to give a summary of what is contained in the mansions, but we should remember the words of the saint. Our Lord grant that I may say something well, since that is exceedingly difficult, which I wish you to understand unless there be experience. Chapter 1. In the first mansions, the saint speaks of the beauty and dignity of a soul in grace. She considers the soul to be a castle of diamonds or most clear crystal, in which are many rooms, as in heaven there are many mansions. She dwells at some length on the means whereby we may enter this castle, remarking, however, that there is a great difference between one room and another some only dwell round the castle never caring to enter nor to know what is within that precious place nor who lives there mental prayer she calls the gate of this castle she then proceeds to show with what attention and devotion we ought to address the majesty of god in the second chapter of the same mansion the saint speaks of the deformity of a soul in mortal sin and this she does in powerful and energetic words as no doubt our lord often revealed to her the miserable condition of a soul in this state she insists on the necessity of knowing ourselves and thus in this first mansion consisting of two chapters those souls are described who have already some good desires who pray mentally or vocally though not so often nor with such great attention as they ought because they are distracted with worldly pleasures and the cares of business which the saint calls 
noisome, and venomous creatures. When such souls know their condition, they seek help by prayer and by humility. This second chapter is written with wonderful energy, unction, and clearness. Her lessons of perfection are most practical. The second mansions contain only one chapter. In it the saint dwells on the great importance of perseverance in order to be able to arrive at the last mansion. Here souls are described who, by reflecting on their present dangerous state, have partly reformed themselves through God's assistance. But they cannot yet conquer their will so far as to avoid the occasions of sin. Hence, not being perfectly dead to themselves, they endure great afflictions and terrible combats. Still, they are called by God in many ways, by pious books, sermons, discourses, sickness, and adversity. The arts and snares which the devil employs to induce the poor soul to return back are most skillfully exposed in this chapter. The third mansions contain two chapters. The saint begins by showing what little security we have in this life, even though we should have reached a high degree of perfection. Here she exemplifies in herself the words of the psalmist, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. So penetrated is the saint with this holy fear, that she assures her daughters she trembles at the judgments of God when she reflects on her past wickedness. Pray, she exclaims, pray, my daughters, that his majesty may ever live in me, for otherwise what security can a life like mine have, which has been so ill spent? She then proceeds to describe those souls who have overcome the great difficulties that are found in the second mansions. They avoid the occasions of sinning, and even abstain from many venial sins. They are lovers of penance, prayer, and recollection, and sometimes they enjoy great content and tenderness, and have the gift of tears, etc. These souls, however, are often troubled with aridities, and are frequently quite discouraged by them, and consequently are very desirous of being delivered from them. She speaks on this point at some length, and takes occasion most earnestly to recommend humility to such souls. The latter part of this first chapter is exceedingly useful, because exceedingly practical. In the second chapter, the saint continues to speak of aridities in prayer. She makes use of some apposite illustrations to explain her meaning, and again recommends humility and a conformity with the will of God in all things. Perfection does not consist in wearing the religious habit, but in the practice of virtue, and in subjecting our will in everything to that of God. Chapter 2 in the fourth mansions, the saint reaches the very height of sublimity. The Holy Spirit evidently has guided her pen in this and the following mansions. In the fourth mansions, souls are advanced to the first degree of supernatural prayer. She speaks of the difference between contents and delights. Those she calls contents, which we acquire by meditation and prayer to our Lord, being satisfied, however, by God. Contents proceed from the particular virtuous action which we exercise, and which it seems we have gained by our labor. The same joy and content, however, we often feel from worldly things, as the saint remarks, though divine contents have a nobler origin. Delights come from God, and nature feels them. The saint proceeds to explain how she experienced these delights in meditation, especially when she meditated on the passion of our Lord. She enters more into details in the second chapter, to which I refer the reader, not daring to make use of any words of my own to explain a subject so sublime. In the third chapter she teaches that quiet and recollection, in which the soul remains inactive and without sediments of God, is an illusion, because in all supernatural prayer the soul is active and vigorous, and is filled with lively sentiments of God. Here the saint precondemns the fanaticism of the quietists. The saint shows that these delights should not be desired for several reasons. In the third chapter, the saint explains what is meant by the prayer of recollection. She describes its effects, and wonderful indeed they are. This chapter can easily be understood, if perused attentively and devoutly. In the fifth mansions are souls still more united to God, by having the interior faculties of the soul, and also the exterior senses, totally suspended, so that the understanding is not able to think on anything but God. The body, too, is deprived of speech, motion, and even sensible breathing, though this lasts but for a short time. The soul feels in her interior a most inexpressible delight and love for God, though she cannot express this delight. Here, the soul is admitted into the very chamber of the king. Here, she is caressed by him. 
here she is filled with the plenty of his house and drinks of the torrent of his pleasures here too secrets of the invisible world are revealed to her which mortal lips can never utter the soul is certain that god is intimately present with her for the saint says god so fixes and settles himself in the interior of the soul that when she comes to herself she can in no way doubt but she was in god and god in her this truth is so deeply rooted in her that though many years pass before god bestow the like favors upon her she never forgets it the saint concludes the first chapter in these words o oh, my daughters what great things shall we see if we look upon nothing else but our own baseness and misery and utter unworthiness to be the servants of so great a lord whose wonders are above our comprehension may he be eternally praised amen the favors bestowed in the fifth mansions are however often accompanied or followed by many afflictions corporeal pains and infirmities and an impatient longing after the enjoyment of god whose inexpressible beauty is now discovered to her she mentions the means whereby a soul may attain a supernatural union viz by conforming ourselves in all things to the will of god and by loving our neighbor as ourselves the sixth mansions contain eleven chapters here the saint seems to excel herself by the clearness and majesty with which she treats the most difficult and sublime subjects visions are seen by the soul in which heavenly truths and many wonderful secrets are more frequently revealed to her she hears certain words or discourses and is certain they are not fancies of the imagination she perceives intellectually our lord though without any visible shape some of the saints also are seen either silent or speaking to her and such visions sometimes continue many days raptures likewise are frequent and in these sometimes the body is raised without knowing whither it goes or who carries it or how etc this is not the place to enter at length into the subject of these wonders nor to answer the objections of protestants most of whom pride themselves in rejecting anything supernatural as absurd or impossible they believe the almighty does not condescend to be so familiar with poor mortals that it is impossible for him to speak to the soul except through the medium of the corporeal senses that saint teresa was evidently an enthusiast and had imposed upon her superiors etc cardinal bona has ably answered these and other objections in his learned and valuable treatise de discretione spirituum the protestant reader should also peruse the able remarks of mr a woodhead in his preface to the translation of saint teresa's works when the saint was canonized by pope gregory the fifteenth these visions and raptures were examined and sifted by the most holy and learned men of the age and pronounced to be authentic and not illusions in such matters we catholics do not measure our belief by the rules of philosophy nor do we exclaim how can this be we know that god's ways are not our ways nor his thoughts our thoughts and that all things are possible with him thank god we belong to a church that does not reject the wonders of the supernatural life in spite of the sneers and scoffs of the skeptic and infidel we ponder on the visions and raptures of saint teresa with deep and reverential amazement giving thanks to our lord that in this sinful and miserable world of ours there once dwelt a soul whom he caressed as the apple of his eye whom he raised to so marvelous a knowledge and experience of his own adorable perfections and in whose life he displayed so signally the might of his boundless power and goodness and the inexhaustible riches of his mercy in the seventh mansion the saint continues in the same sublime strain she explains the difference between spiritual union and spiritual marriage in the third chapter are described the extraordinary effects which follow these favors the soul perceives in her interior the presence of the adorable trinity but this without any rapture or suspension of the senses or other faculties the soul then arrives at perfect contemplation the fourth and last chapter is exceedingly practical in the concluding paragraph the saint says that though she has spoken only of seven mansions yet in each of these mansions there are many more above below and on the sides together with many fair gardens fountains and other delights etc she submits her works to the judgment of the holy catholic roman church wherein she says i live and do protest and promise to live and die such is the short summary i have given of this sublime work but how imperfect is it 
The truth is, it is impossible to do justice to the subject. One must have a deep knowledge of mystic theology to speak with any degree of correctness and certitude. I acknowledge my ignorance, my poor ability to say anything deserving the attention of my superiors. My only desire and ambition have been to give a faithful translation of the saints' words. Whether I have succeeded, others will decide, but whatever faults or defects may be noticed, I trust to the kind indulgence of the reader, who will, I hope, make every allowance when he considers what a difficult task it must have been to translate so sublime a work. Indeed, I should never have been able to translate many parts, had I not consulted the translation made with such ability by the illustrious convert, Mr. A. Woodhead. I have carefully endeavored to make use of the singular pronoun when any prayer or exclamation is addressed to our Lord. John Dalton Preface of St. Teresa Among the things which I have been commanded to do under obedience, few have proved so difficult to me as writing at present something on prayer, and this for two reasons because it seems to me our Lord does not give me spirit, nor a desire to write, and also because I have had, for the last three months, such a noise in my head, attended with extreme weakness, that I write with pain, even on necessary business. But knowing the power of obedience, which makes things easy that seem impossible, my will is determined to undertake the work very cheerfully, though nature seems exceedingly adverse to it because our Lord has not given me such virtue that I should be able to accomplish the task, considering how I have to endure continual sickness, and how many different employments occupy my time, without great resistance on the part of nature. May he be pleased to accomplish the work, who has performed other more difficult things for me, in his mercy I trust. I am confident I shall be able to say little more, than what I have said on other matters about which I have been commanded to write. I am even fearful lest what I may say should be almost the same. For as birds which learn to speak know no more than just what is taught them or what they hear, and this they often repeat, so do I in like manner. Hence, if our Lord wishes me to say anything new, His Majesty will teach it to me, or will be pleased to recall to my mind what I have said elsewhere. Even this would satisfy me, because I have such a bad memory, and I should be glad to touch upon some of those things which people say have been correctly handled, lest perhaps they might be lost. If our Lord should not please to grant me this favor, however much I may weary myself, and increase the pain in my head by obedience, I shall be a gainer, even though no fruit whatever should come from what I say. Wherefore, I commence the work this day, being the feast of the Most Holy Trinity in the year 1577, in order to obey the command given to me, and I am now living in the convent of St. Joseph of Mount Carmel, at Toledo. I submit in all that I shall say to the judgment of those who have commanded me to write, because they are persons of great learning. If perchance I shall say anything which does not exactly agree with what the Holy Catholic Church holds, it will be through ignorance and not in malice. This may be taken for certain, since I have always been, am, and shall be, by the grace of God, subject to her voice. May our Lord be eternally blessed and glorified. Amen. I have been told by those who commanded me to write this book, that as the nuns of this convent of Our Lady of Mount Carmel require someone to explain to them certain doubts regarding prayer, they thought that as women understand one another's language best, and the nuns love me, what I should say would do them more good than the words of others. For these reasons, they consider it very important that I should undertake to say something on the subject. Hence, I consider that, in what I write, I am speaking only to them, for it seems foolish to think that my words can be of service to others. Our Lord will do me a great favor, if any one among the nuns shall hereby be moved to praise him ever so little more. His Majesty knows well I have no other object. It is very evident that when I happen to say anything to the point, people will know it is not mine, since there is no reason to think so. But they will discover in me a very poor capacity for such things, unless our Lord, through His mercy, shall give me understanding. Teresa de Jesus End of the Preface, Part 2 The First Mansion, Chapter 1 of The Interior Castle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The First Mansion, Chapter 1. The saint speaks of the beauty and dignity of our souls, and mentions that the gate of this castle is prayer. When I was once requesting our Lord to speak for me, because I knew not what to say, nor how to commence obeying my superior, what I shall now relate occurred to me. But in order that I may begin on some foundation, let us consider our soul as a castle, composed entirely of diamonds, or very clear crystal, in which there are many rooms, just as in heaven there are many mansions. If we consider the subject properly, sisters, we shall see that the soul of a just man is nothing else but a paradise, wherein the Lord thereof takes his recreation. What a beautiful room, then, ought that to be, think you, in which a king so powerful, so wise, so pure, so full of every perfection, delights himself. I know of nothing to which I can compare the great beauty of a soul and its wonderful capacity. Truly, however enlarged our understanding may be, it is unable to comprehend the beauty of a soul, just as it cannot comprehend who God is. For he saith himself, that he created us in his own image and likeness. If this then be the truth, as it certainly is, we need not weary ourselves in endeavoring to understand the beauty of this castle. For though between it and God there is the same difference that exists between the Creator and the creature, yet in order to understand the great dignity and beauty of the soul, it is sufficient that his majesty has said, he made it after his own image. It is a great source of misery and confusion to us, that we do not know ourselves. Would it not be gross ignorance, my daughters, for some one, on being asked who he was, not to know who was his father or mother, or what country he was born in? If this then would be great stupidity, how much greater without comparison is that which is found in us, when we do not strive to know what we are, but fix all our thoughts on these bodies of ours, and thus only generally and superficially do we know that we have souls, because we have heard so, and because our faith tells us. But seldom do we consider what great things are contained in this soul, or who lives within it, or how immense is its value. Hence it is that we take such little care to preserve its beauty. All our attention is fixed on the roughness of the case, or the walls of this castle, which are our bodies. Let us imagine, then, that this castle, as I have said, has several mansions or rooms, some above, some below, and others on the sides, and that in the center of all these is the principal room, in which subjects of the greatest secrecy are discussed between God and the soul. You should often reflect on this comparison, for perhaps our Lord may be pleased that I should help you by means thereof, to understand something regarding those favors He is pleased to bestow on souls and what difference there is in them. This I may be able to explain, as far as my understanding can reach, but it is impossible for one to understand them all, because there are many, and how much more for a person so ignorant as I am. To you, however, this will be a great consolation, whenever our Lord shall make you understand these favors, and this is possible. But for those on whom he is not pleased to bestow this gift, it may nevertheless serve as an occasion of praising his immense goodness. For as the contemplation of the joys of heaven, and those things which the blessed enjoy, does us no harm, but we rather rejoice in the contemplation, and endeavor to attain what they possess, so neither will it hurt us to consider how in this land of exile it is possible for so great a God to communicate himself to such miserable worms as we are, and for such immense goodness and boundless mercy to love us. I consider it certain that whoever shall consider he might receive harm by believing it possible for God in this exile to bestow such favors, such a person stands in great need of humility and love for his neighbor. How can we otherwise help rejoicing that God bestows these favors on a brother of ours, when we see that this does not hinder him from bestowing the same on us? His majesty sometimes bestows them only in order to manifest them. As he said concerning the blind man to whom he restored his sight, when the apostles asked whether that blindness came through his own sins or the sins of his parents, 
hence it is that he bestows these favors not because those to whom he gives them are more holy than those to whom he does not give them but merely to show his greatness such as was the case in st paul and mary magdalene and that we may praise him in his creatures some may say these things seem impossible and that it is good not to scandalize the weak i reply that the loss is less for these not to believe such wonders than to forbear doing good to those on whom god bestows them and who will thereby excite themselves the more to love him who shows them such mercy and whose power and majesty are so great this i may do the more because i know i speak to those who are in no danger of taking scandal and they know and believe also that god gives even far greater proofs of his love i know that he will not believe this will never find it by experience in himself for our lord is exceedingly desirous not to have his works limited and thus sisters let this never happen to any of you whom our lord shall not lead in this way returning now to our beautiful and delightful castle we must consider how we are to enter it i may here seem to speak incorrectly because if this castle be the soul it is clear there is no need to enter it since it is the castle itself just as it would appear ridiculous to tell a person to go into a room when he is already in it but you must understand that there is a great difference between one room and another for many souls dwell near the walls of the castle these where the guards are and yet never care about going further into it neither do they wish to know what is within that precious place nor who lives there nor what rooms there are now you have heard or read in some books of prayer that a soul is advised to enter into herself and this is the same that i say here a very learned man told me not long ago that souls without the exercise of prayer are like a body that has the palsy or that is lame and though it has feet and hands it cannot use them in like manner some souls are so weak and so immersed in exterior things that they cannot by any means enter into themselves for being always accustomed to converse with the vermin that are about the castle they are become almost like them and though by nature they are so richly endowed and enabled to hold communication even with god himself yet they do not recover themselves now unless these souls endeavor to understand and remedy their great misery they must continue statues of salt like lot's wife being unable to turn their head as far as i can understand the gate by which we are to enter this castle is prayer and consideration i speak of mental as well as vocal being prayer it should be made with attention for she who does not consider with whom she speaks and what she asks and who she is that asks and of whom she asks knows little of prayer however much her lips may move and though sometimes prayer is made when there is no actual advertence yet this attention is requisite at other times but whoever shall accustom himself to speak with the majesty of god as he would talk with his slave without considering whether he speaks properly or no but who speaks only what comes first into his head or what he may have learned by heart by repeating it at other times this i do not consider to be prayer and god grant that no christian may pray in this manner among you my sisters i hope in his majesty this will never happen on account of the custom we have of being exercised in interior matters for this is a very good means of not falling into the like stupidity let us not then speak of these maimed souls who suffer great misery and run great hazards unless our lord himself come and bid them rise up as he did to the man that had frequented the pool for eight and thirty years but let us address those other souls who have at length entered the castle for though they may be deeply immersed in the world yet they have good desires and sometimes though seldom they recommend themselves to god they consider what they are though not so seriously and so calmly as they should they pray sometimes in a month with a mind full of a thousand distractions and cares this is generally the case for they are so wedded to earthly things that having placed therein their treasure their heart is there also they sometimes try to free themselves from these cares and this knowledge of themselves is very beneficial since they discover they do not go the right way to enter in at the gate at last they enter into the first rooms below but so much vermin with them that they are prevented from seeing the beauty of the castle 
nor can they be at rest. It is well that they have entered. What I have been saying may seem to you unnecessary, my daughters, since by the goodness of our Lord you are not to be numbered amongst these. But you must have patience, because I know not how to make you understand some interior things about prayer which I have learnt, except by this means. Our Lord grant that I may be able to say something well, since that is exceedingly difficult which I wish to make you understand, unless there is experience. If there be, you will see that less cannot be done than to touch on that which God grant, in His great mercy, may never happen to us. End of the First Mansion, Chapter 1